Hello and welcome back to my channel. If you've been keeping up with what I've been working on, then you're probably aware that Brandon, one of the guys that I'm building a hand for, visited the shop for a couple of days. It was a half Saturday, full day Sunday, and most of a Monday trip for him. We ended up pulling some super long hours trying to maximize the amount of work that we were able to get done during his visit. And thanks to the new resin printer and wash station that Elegoo recently sent me, we were able to get all of the custom pieces prototyped, iterated, and ready to machine from aluminum. By the end of the second day, we had the rough workings of his hand together enough that he was able to very carefully use it to pick up a couple of small things off my welding table. Of course, that's jumping ahead in the story. Let's go back to the beginning of his visit to the shop. So the first thing that we started working on when he got here was, of course, the socket. A couple of days before his visit, I used my FL Sun printers to print a couple 2mm thick socket shells. To make the shell, I scanned the outside of my current socket with my Creality Ferret Pro scanner, then used Mesh Mixer to extrude the profile 2mm to the inside. The reason for doing it this way is the outside of the socket has a pair of ridges that make up the mating surface for the mounting rails that index and lock the mechanics of the device relative to the socket. This is one of the big things that makes my device different from others that are currently available on the market. With my device, the socket is an independent component that mounts to the rest of the device, rather than the socket being the foundation of the device that all of the other components mount to. This means that you can easily swap sockets if all of a sudden your socket becomes less than comfortable. Or, bigger picture, if for some reason someone decides that my device no longer suits their needs, they could send it back to me and if I had someone that felt the device would be perfect for them, I could scan, iterate, and swap in a new socket and pass the device on to someone else. This is a huge difference from what prosthetics are currently. Now, off my soapbox and back to the project. So the first step in fitting the shell was to see how it fit on Brandon's residual limb without any silicone. We started by sliding the shell into the finger assemblies that I made ahead of time. A week or so before Brandon was scheduled to come out to the shop, I did the rough assembly and fitting for his three finger assembly, along with machining a custom winder for his setup. It was important to use a mostly complete finger assembly instead of just the metacarpal bases and mounting rails for this so that we could be sure that the fingers not only sit deep enough on his residual limb, but also make sure that he's able to get a good crossing motion with his thumb and index finger when the fingers are in the closed position. Also, if we need to rotate the fingers forward or back relative to his palm, this would be a great time to figure that out and adjust things accordingly. At the same time, we're able to establish the alignment of the fingers relative to the rest of his hand in a resting position. So, with the empty socket mashed onto his residual limb, I took a sharpie and made a couple of witness marks of where the socket naturally sits and started mixing up 50 grams each A and B of Alumilite silicon mold putty. Once it was thoroughly mixed, I lined the inside of the shell with silicone and had him mash it back onto his hand, being sure to line up the witness marks. The mold putty has a working time of about 20 minutes. Once it started to form a skin, I did a quick rough trim and had him carefully take it off his residual limb. With the socket off, I was able to check and see if there were any voids or low spots in the silicone. There was a tiny pocket on the back of his hand and what looked to be a low spot on his palm. I used some of the trimmings to fill in the void and had him carefully put the socket back on and wait for the rest of the curing process. After another 20 or 30 minutes, the silicone had firmed up pretty nicely and we were ready to do a first scan of his new socket. This was a perfect opportunity to use the Moose 3D scanner that 3D Maker Pro sent me a while back. The Moose scanner is a 3D scanner intended to be used to capture small objects. Think 15 to 200 millimeters cubed. The literature says it can do objects up to 1500 millimeters, but honestly, there are better systems out there if you're working in that range. At 100 by 200 for a single capture range, the scanner has a super tight scanning aperture. I had the best luck with this scanner, scanning things that were 150 millimeters cubed or smaller. 
Something to keep in mind when you're working with this scanner is that it needs to be connected to a power outlet along with a USB-A port on your laptop. I had the best results with this scanner locked off on a tripod, on a desk, positioned next to your computer, and next to a couple of power outlets. Also something to think about when you're considering if this scanner is going to work for you. The scanner is not compatible with tracking dots or marking dice. So larger scans that don't have a bunch of variation in topology would be incredibly difficult to capture. They do offer a smart grip accessory for this scanner that acts as a power supply and allows you to use the scanner with the cell phone version of the software. And it would in theory make the scanner more mobile but without it being able to use dots or dice, I'm not sure that having the, the smart grip would actually have improved my experience that much, if any. The 3D Maker Pro Moose Scanner, it uses structured light along with near IR and AI visual tracking to capture the object. The scanner that I received, including a turntable with contrasting platter, a small tripod, and an assortment of cables. Something interesting about the turntable, neither the scanner or processing software used rotational data from the turntable. Also, there's no on or off button for the turntable. You plug it into a USB and it starts spinning. For full transparency, 3D Makeup Pro sent me this scanner free of charge. They have zero input or first look at this video. Also, I did not sign up for their ShareASale affiliate program. So let's talk about the good and bad of this scanner. It took a lot of practice, but eventually I was able to get complete scans on smaller items. Because of the small aperture and frame rate of 10 frames per second, it's probably best to plan on using it to capture good detail on smaller objects. Think 150 millimeter, 6 inches cubed, or smaller. They claim you can do larger scans by stitching a bunch of small scans into one large scan, but without dice or markers, it could be a pretty tedious process. Something that I noticed with combining scans, the more scans that I combined, the greater the dimensional inaccuracy I saw. The scanner worked pretty well when I paired it with the turntable and tripod, and I didn't have any tracking issues when I used it that way. But being tethered to a power outlet and laptop is kind of tough when you're used to truly wireless scanning. You could purchase the Smart Grip, but keep in mind the Smart Grip isn't a Wi Fi node and it's only a power supply for the scanner and phone. Also, by using the Smart Grip, you will be using the cell phone version of the software to process the scans. Speaking of the software, JM Studio is the software that works with this scanner. In order for it to work with the scanner, you'll need to create an account and log in. I'm not a huge fan of needing to connect to the internet and log into an account every time I want to use the scanner. The software does have a guest mode for use in offline scenarios, but the software definitely seems to work better when it's connected to the internet. This seems to me like something that could turn into subscription-based access in the future. I'm probably just paranoid, but it kind of seems to be the way that things have been going lately. Also, where the scanner has a capture rate of 10 frames per second, it can get lost pretty easily. My experience is that if it does get lost and doesn't immediately pick back up, it's better just to restart the scan rather than closing it out and trying to stitch it to another file. Also, if you can, it's better to get the whole scan captured in one go rather than trying to piece it together. Something else that takes some practice, the distance where the scanner considers too close to too far from your object is only about an inch and a half, two inches. So that takes some practice to get the hang of. So that's my take on the 3D Maker Pro Moose Scanner. It's mostly geared towards scanning tiny objects. If that's in your workflow, maybe look at picking one up. I'll be doing a review on the Creality Raptor Scanner with the Wi-Fi base soon. So be on the lookout for that video in the future. Now back to Brandon's visit. So it took a couple of attempts, but I finally was able to get a complete scan of both the inside and outside of the socket. From there, I processed it using JM Studio and exported the mesh as an OBJ. I imported the file into Mesh Mixer and smoothed out a couple areas where the scanner had some issues. From there, I exported the revised mesh and opened it up in the FL Sun Slicer and printed the Rev1 sockets. 
I printed the sockets using both the S1 Pro and T1 Pro machines. The reason I chose those printers over my other machines was the print speed. The FL Sun could print one socket in right at an hour, where the Creality K2 Plus would take just shy of three hours for the same print. I ran it on both my Delta machines. Just in case something went sideways with the print, I'd more than likely have at least one socket to work with. But fortunately, both prints were successful, giving me an extra one just in case I screwed something up in the trimming. The next step in the process was to refine the print and make it to where it was something that was going to be comfortable for Brandon to wear. What I'm doing here is rather than spending a pile of time getting the perfect drawing, I tend to focus my time on getting a drawing that's close enough that I can sand it into shape, planning on iterating by scanning and printing the revision. The issue that I keep running into with this project is that for the most part, I'm making one-offs of all of these printed parts. It'd be a different story if in the end, I was printing the same thing for more than one device. But the fact is, Brandon's socket is only going to fit Brandon. So no sense putting in any more time into the drawing than what is absolutely necessary. A perfect use case for this scan to iterate process is the little stob that I need for the winder and the anchor on the palm strap. To draw this and get the alignment perfect in the digital space would take absolutely way too long. So what I did was print out the shape of the stop and sand it to match the profile of the back of the socket where it needed to be. From there, I super glued it into position and used my soldering iron and a bit of filament to plastic weld and fillet the two pieces together. From there, I scanned it again and printed the version two. For the forearm brace, I did something very similar. I scanned Brandon's forearm and printed a shell two millimeters larger this time. I then trimmed the shell to the approximate shape that I was looking for and glued EVA foam that I cut into an ISO grid pattern using the Creality Falcon Pro 60 watt laser. Review videos soon to come on this machine comparing it to the regular Falcon laser cutter. I found that by cutting the ISO grid, super gluing it to the shape, and scanning it into the digital file, you can get a super strong shape in way less time than it would take to draw it in AutoCAD. For instance, I only have about five and a half hours into printing, scanning, and iterating this forearm cuff. And the best part about it is, it actually fits. If I were to try this only using AutoCAD, there is absolutely no way that it would fit as well as it does. I'll have more on Brandon's video and how I ended up making the Gaffney plate in the next video. Let me know what you think in the comments section. Thanks for watching. Yeah? What's up? Did you have an exciting day outside today? Yeah? Very exciting. Yeah. You a good kitty? Are you a super good kitty? How's your shoulder doing? Somebody kind of ate on you a little bit ago. Your shoulder okay? Yeah? Okay. You happy to see me today? Yeah? Okay, should we go get the mail? Yeah? You wanna go get the mail first? No? What's up, guy? Hey, buddy. You go inside? Yeah? Okay, let's go inside. Let's get some treats. Okay. I'm glad you had a good day outside.